أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المذلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقذكم منها كذلك يبين الله لكم آياته لعلكم تهتدون صلوات الله محمد Tonight is the third night in our series on Orthodox Islam. And last night we began discussing issues and concerns that Muslims as a community have with regards to the Shia. And we said the single most contentious issues is the Shia's attitude towards the Sahaba or the companions of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu wa sallam wa alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And we have begun to show that the Shias are not anti-Sahaba, the Shias madhab is not based on cursing the Sahaba, and that we in fact have utmost respect for those who sacrificed their wealth, their lives, their families for the sake of Islam. And I will particularly make mention of how great the contribution of the Sahaba was in the early days of Islam and even in the days of Medina and the Muhajirun and Ansar when I begin discussing um, the early Khilafa in, in uh, two, or, two or three nights from now. Um, but I am as well beginning to receive some feedback from the brothers with regards to the two lectures we've had so far. One of the suggestions I've received is that when I am quoting references from the books that are considered to be authentic by our Sunni brothers and sisters, the, for example, say Bukhari and Muslim that I provide precise and exact references. The reason I'm not doing this is multiple. One is the fact that it will obviously take more time. I am already taking more time, and that will be in another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, secondly, it would make it a bit more tedious it, if at every reference I start telling you volume number, page number, hadith number, which is more appropriate in a classroom setting. Moreover, a lot of times the version of publications vary from one publisher to another. So the volume and page number I give you that I have may not necessarily be the one that you have. I will, however, try and provide references to sources that you can go look at, at which you can find these information consolidated in one place. So all the references I made last night to reports concerning the Sahaba in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, and other books, and all the uh, reports that I will be sharing tonight as well from Bukhari and Muslim. Um, if you want to find them all in one place, one source is the books by Dr. Samawi Tajani. You've all heard of Dr. Samawi Tajani's famous book, Then I Was Guided, Thumma Tadayt. He has multiple books such as A Shia Hum Ahlu Sunnah, The Shia are the Real Ahlu Sunnah. And he has one book called Fas'alu Ahla Dhikr in Kuntum La Ta'alamun, Ask Those Who Know. So if you go online and search for Ask Those Who Know by Dr. Tijani, and in particular if you go to al-islam.org, you will find all of Dr. Tijani's books online in English freely available. But this one book will give you all the references I made yesterday and um, tonight. Um, the other concern that has been raised is that given that the subject we're discussing is so sensitive and so contentious, how do we ensure that we are able to discuss this whilst being comfortable so that 
no one feels out of place, even if it is a Sunni brother or sister participating in these lectures. And how do we ensure that we don't make this egoic and just about us versus them or you versus me? If at the end of these lectures we've only been able to prove that the Shias are right and the Sunnis are wrong, then what have we accomplished? So I want to once again emphasize and stress that the purpose of these lectures is not to divide the Muslims in any way, shape or form. But there are multiple reasons for this. The first reason is to explain the Shia perspective because even though a vast number of our Sunni brothers and sisters do not do takfir to us and do not say the Shias are kafir, they certainly, certainly have this concern on their minds that we have broken away from mainstream and that we do not treat the, the, the Sahaba with respect, for example. So we're trying to explain the Shia perspective from a side that would hopefully come across as common sense without requiring you know, a lot of proof from Shia sources. Secondly, <clears throat> I want to also emphasize that the purpose of an intention behind these lectures is not to convert anyone. I am not in any delusion that at the end of these lectures there will be Sunni brothers and sisters converting to Tashayyo in droves. Nor do I expect that to happen. The purpose is to say that Sunnis can remain Sunnis, Shia can remain Shia. But there are certain principles that are missing in the Ummah that we need to restore. In particular the issue of justice and how we subscribe this sense of there is nothing unjust in our past history. It is just glorious and it's just been a golden age that we have lost and that we must now try and restore. We're simply trying to say let us be realistic and acknowledge the mistakes that have been made and identify where we are missing important principles that we need to restore in the Ummah. And if we can agree on those, such as for example, we must be led by leaders who have adala. then it doesn't necessarily mean everyone has to become a Shia or a Sunni. But there is a vast change in the Muslim attitude and perception which inshallah would lead and help towards the plight of Muslims today. The third issue is that you know, there is also this concern that can we not acknowledge that our Sunni brothers and sisters do love the Ahlul Bayt. And in fact, many of the Sufi tariqahs take their origin and start from Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Salawatullahi wa salam alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So we are already united in terms of spirituality, in terms of akhlaq, in terms of mawadda and mahabba of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam. But my concern is this, that is it sufficient to only love the Ahlul Bayt? You see, there are Hindus who love Imam al Hussein and compose poetry of Imam al Hussein. But does that mean it is sufficient? The problem is that loving the Ahlul Bayt is not sufficient because we can all be inspired from the wise sayings of wise people. There are Muslims who find inspiration from the sayings of Greek philosophers. They find inspirations from the sayings of Jesus and from the Buddha and from other New Age sages as well. So it is easy to unite on that principle. But what about the aqidah of the Ahlul Bayt And as I alluded to it last night, that the perspective I'm trying to share is that what the Quran had intended was to put the Ahlul Bayt front and center as the guides of the Ummah after the Prophet But something went wrong and their importance was downplayed and the sanctity and importance of the Sahaba whose tathir or sanctity is not given by the Qur'an, was put up in place of that. And this was not the fault or a malicious attempt by the vast majority of Muslims that we call Sunni today, but it was a ploy by the few who ruled over Muslims as family dynasties, such as the Umayyads and the Abbasids. So we continue along that journey tonight, and tonight we, left, we leave from where we, we, we start from where we left off last night to say, Look at how we as Muslims have become that if anything is said about the Sahaba, we are so disturbed by it, we are so concerned that this will cause division and fight, we immediately feel that this is, you know, kufr and shirk and, you know, we, aside, we, we ascribe takfir to those who say anything against the Sahaba. But what do we say about the Prophet ﷺ himself? Now let us look at that. 
And we, I'm going to share a number of traditions that will shock and surprise from the most authentic books of the Muslims, which is Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. But before I do that, I want to first, because my audience is largely Shia here for tonight, I want to first explain to you what the importance of Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim is to Muslims. You see, the Shi'as don't have this concept of any book of Hadith being absolutely accurate with no mistake. There is no Sahih Al-Kafi. From the Shia perspective, it is only the Quran that is absolutely beyond reproach and doubt and contradiction or mistake. Any Hadith, no matter how authentic for ages, can be questioned by one who is qualified. A Marja'a today can question a Hadith that Sheikh Al-Mufid or Allama Hilli had regarded authentic and doubt its authenticity. With the proper knowledge and research of knowing Isnad and Ilm al-Rijal and so on and so forth. But in the Sunni concept, there is this idea of six collections of hadith that are beyond reproach. And out of these six that are called Siha Sitta, there are two in particular, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, in that order of first and second that are absolutely beyond reproach. Now let me share a few opinions on this. A very famous scholar amongst the Sunnis and the Salafis, Imam al-Haramain al-Juwaini, you may have heard the name. He says, and he writes in one of his books, he says, if a man takes an oath that I will divorce my wife if there is any hadith in Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim that is false, then he will not have to divorce his wife nor break his oath. Do you understand what he's saying? What he's saying is you can put your marriage on the line to vouch for the authenticity of Bukhari and Muslim. It is that authentic. There are 7,563 traditions in Sahih Bukhari and Imam al-Bukhari says for every single hadith I collected, I checked its authenticity and then I prayed two rakats to Allah as istikhara, asking him for khair and to help me that this hadith should be accurate and correct. Every hadith, 7,563, he prayed two rakats. Imam Nawawi, another very famous, well-known, established scholar, theologian, faqih, shafi'i amongst the Sunnis, who lived in the 13th century, he has a very famous collection of 40 hadith called the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi. It's called Al Arba'una An Nawawiya. And in many Sunni mosques, they have classes and commentaries. They do sharh of this Al Arba'una An Nawawiya. Very, very respected scholar. He says, The Ummah is unanimously agreed that these two books, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, are Sahih and it is wajib to follow the ahadith in this. That means if you go to a Muslim court where it is ruling on the basis of Sharia law, you can use Sahih Bukhari and Muslim to argue your case. It is absolute proof and hujjah. And then the famous Ibn Taymiyyah, who is a founder and a foundation stone for the Salafis, he is called Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, there is no book beneath the canopy of the heavens that is more sound and more authentic than Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim after the Quran. And if you go online, you will find there are Sunni Muslims who have tried to argue this case to say, really, is everything authentic? Because this book was compiled 200 years after the Prophet by a fallible being. And there is a lot of backlash against it. And some of the scholars have said, there are only 20 criticisms in Sahih Bukhari, of which most are regarding the chain of transmission. There is only two or three ahadith where issues have been raised with regards to the content, and those two are minor. And they're not related to the ahadith that I am sharing with you tonight. So you got this now. This is like almost parallel to the Quran. There is nothing inauthentic in this book to the Muslim Ummah. Now, in Sahih Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim, there is a hadith from Anas bin Malik. He says that one day I saw a man trying to peep into the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala. 
And Rasulullah was so upset, he took an arrow and he tried to stab the man in the eye that he was peeping into his house. And Anas bin Malik says, it is as if I can see right now the Prophet holding the head of the arrow trying to stab the man. Sahih hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Next hadith. In Sahih Bukhari, there is a hadith that says, and this, as I said, go to the book, ask those who know, you will get volume number, page number, hadith, full references. There was a group of men that came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked for food and shelter. The Prophet ﷺ had a shepherd. So he sent these people to his shepherd, and the shepherd was kind and generous to them. He helped them out. After they had been helped by the shepherd, they killed the shepherd and stole his you know, sheep or whatever. The Messenger of Allah sent people to arrest these people. And when they were brought to the Prophet ﷺ, he had their arms and legs amputated. And then he had their eyes branded with hot iron. And Anas bin Malik says, it is again as if I can see one of them on the ground with his limbs amputated, licking the earth and the sand until he died. Hadith number three. When Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib was killed in the battle of Uhud, because the Prophet ﷺ was up on a mount and the Muslims had fled, the Quraysh came and began to mutilate the body of the Prophet's uncle. And the wife of Abu Sufyan in particular wanted to avenge her father and brother who were killed at Badr. So she had a slave who came and cut open Hamza's body and she took out the liver of Hamza and chewed it. Because of which from that day the descendants of Abu Sufyan are called children of the liver chewer or the woman who chews livers. Now, Sahih Bukhari says that when the Prophet saw the body of his uncle mutilated, he was so upset. He said, by Allah, if Allah gives me victory over the Quraysh, I will mutilate 70 of their bodies in revenge for what they did to my uncle. And because of that, Allah revealed chapter 16, verse 126, that says, if you retaliate, O Prophet, then retaliate in an equal measure. And if you are patient, then it is better that you be patient. Now, we ask this question. Allah describes the Prophet ﷺ in Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 159. He says, lahum, walau kunta qalb, lan min hawlik. It is by the mercy of Allah that you are so gentle and kind to them. If you had been harsh-hearted, O Muhammad, they would have all fled away from you. What does this tell you right away? That all these narrations that you have heard about the Prophet are in contradiction to this ayah of Quran. The Quran is saying that, O Rasul, you are so gentle. If you had been faddan ghalid al-qalb, they would have all fled from you. The authentic hadith in a book that there is no book under the heavens that is more authentic than this, is portraying a very different prophet before us. So right away there's a couple of things that we need to talk about. First is, when I say we need to talk about these things, and you are disturbed and bothered by it, why do we need to talk about it? This is why we need to talk about it. We need to reopen this debate amongst Muslims and say, can we continue like this, insisting that all the Sahaba had Adala, that all these books are authentic, when it directly misportrays the greatest personality in Islam. It contradicts the Quran. And if this hadith was Sahih, then how does it portray the Messenger of God? It portrays him wal billah, wal billah, as an extremist and a violent man. Does it not do that? I ask you a simple question that when you 
hear of a man who is the founder of a religion behaving in this manner, amputating legs and branding eyes with hot iron and mutilating bodies, would you blame if his followers behaved the way ISIS does? Why? Because the Quran in chapter 33 verse 21 says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Uswatun Hasana. There is for you in the Messenger of God the best role model to follow. So what happens is when you claim that all these traditions are authentic, you create this idea in the Muslim psyche that this is what our founder was like. And then it plays out in different people in different ways. Now human nature is not one to be violent. So the vast majority of Muslims would not be violent. 99.999% Shia Sunni would not behave like ISIS does. But there is always a minority that is ignorant, that is violent, that is extremist, that is malicious. And all they need is justification to use Islam to commit the horrors that they commit. And what better excuse would they get if they find this in the founder of Islam himself? And if we cannot call out these traditions and say these are false, then what should we do with these traditions? Now, so when we say that the Shias don't agree with the majority, or the Shias don't take hadith from Abu Huraira, or the Shias don't agree with Sahih Bukhari, it is not because we want to break away from the Muslim Ummah. It is because of these reasons that we are not addressing these issues as Muslims. We cannot be so naive and bury our heads in the sand and say there's nothing wrong with this picture. Let's take a few more examples. In Bukhari and Muslim, it says that one day the Prophet ﷺ was leading for Salatul Dhuhr. And instead of four rakats, he prayed two rakats. <coughs> when he finished Salatul Dhuhr, the Muslims were worried, but no one dared to ask him. Finally, one of the Muslims plucked the courage and he came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, did you forget or was something revealed from Allah to change the law so that Dhuhr is two rakats? And Bukhari and Muslims say that the Prophet ﷺ said to the man, No, I didn't forget. I prayed four rakats. He said, No, Ya Rasulullah, we all pray two rakats. He said, Really? Then he made up and prayed the other two rakats. The most authentic books are relating this. How does this play out later on? The way it plays out later on, I'm showing you how the Umayyads forge tradition, is that when Walid bin Utba in Kufa leads Fajr prayers, and he leads three, four, five rakats because he's drunk, and then turns to the people and said, have you had enough or do you want to pray some more? Now you can't blame him, right? Because the founder of religion also makes mistakes. And then let me ask something to all of you. Muslims, Shia and Sunni. We're all human. Okay, the Shia say the Rasulullah is infallible. He wouldn't make this mistake. And the Sunnis as well believe he is infallible. But when revelation comes, and let's forget about infallibility for a second. We've all made mistakes and forgotten in Salat. We're human. That's why we have the laws of Shakiyat of Salat. You have all had times when you had to pray four rakats and you prayed three. And you've all had times when you had to pray four rakah and you prayed five. Sometimes you realized it yourself. Sometimes you had a doubt. Did, did I miss one or did I pray an extra one? And sometimes you finished and then someone sitting beside you said, Bai kya how come you prayed an extra or you missed, right? But has anyone ever skipped two rakats? Anyone? You've all lived 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. If it was Fajr, yes. But have you ever prayed a four rakat, not while you are traveling, and you missed the mark by two rakats? Never. And Rasulullah does this. In the most authentic books of the Muslims. Again, not to mock, not to jeer, not to laugh, not to be derogatory. It pains us. This is the concern. Okay. There is another hadith in Bukhari that says two men were arguing about an ayah of Quran. One recited it this way, the other one recited it that way. 
So they came to Rasulullah sallallahu and said, Ya Rasulullah, he is reciting it this way, but I'm saying it is that way. Correct him. Bukhari says that the Prophet sallallahu said to them, both of you are right. Don't fight about it because those before you disputed and they were destroyed. This is a fundamental principle of the Umayyads. The Umayyads built their dynasty on this principle that Allah has destined who should be the rulers and whoever is over you, even if he be a tyrant, it is haram to overthrow and fight him. Always stay with the community because Yadullahi ma'al jama'ah, the hand of God is with the majority. And previous communities were destroyed because they kept fighting amongst themselves. So whenever you have differences, sweep them under the rug, but stay united. And we will always have to make this choice in life. Either we go with truth, but risk disagreeing, or we hide the truth for the sake of unity. But then it festers within and it will play out in other ways, such as when we interact with other communities. The Prophet himself is telling them, and this is revelation from God, he's saying, no, both of you, both versions are right. What was revealed to you, Ya Rasulullah? He is not telling them. He's saying, both of you are right, don't fight. Okay. Another uh, report. One hadith from Bukhari says that Rasulullah once heard someone reciting a verse of Quran and he said, may Allah have mercy on him. I had forgotten this ayat that it was part of this surah and he reminded me. This is in Bukhari. Now look at what Surah Al-A'la says, chapter 87, verse 6. سَنُقْرِئُكَ فَلَا tansa. We shall make you recite this book, O Muhammad, in such a manner, you will never forget it. Sanukriuka fala tansa. You will never forget it. But Sahih Bukhari, that has no hadith that is wrong, is insisting, the Prophet said, may Allah have on this mercy. I forgot this, this man, I forgot this ayah, he reminded me. So we are asking Muslims, Okay, we Shia are bad, we curse Sahaba, we are Rafidi, we are all that. What should we do? There is a clear contradiction between the Quran and a Sahih Hadith. There has to be a solution to this. I share just one or two other Hadith and I, I'll wrap this up. Bukhari narrates that one day the Prophet ﷺ was unwell and his wife Aisha and others were trying to give him medicine. And he kept gesturing to them, I don't want the medicine. But they forced him to drink the medicine. When he felt better, he said to them, was I not telling you through gestures not to give me this medicine, but you forced me. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we thought you were like a patient who doesn't want the bitter medicine and is resisting what's good for him and we wanted you to get better, so we forced you. So Bukhari says, the Prophet now said, because you did this to me, I want everyone in the household to come here and this medicine should be poured in the mouth of everyone by force while I am looking at it. How childish is this? But you are ascribing it to whom? Now I give you one final hadith. Bukhari says that the Prophet ﷺ used to time and again curse people, insult people, and even whip them. On one occasion, two men came to see him, and they had a disagreement, and the Prophet ﷺ began cursing and insulting them. When they left, his wife Aisha said to him, Ya Rasulullah, because you have cursed and insulted them, then definitely these people will never benefit from the mercy of Allah. To which the Messenger of Allah said to her, I am but a mortal and sometimes I end up cursing and insulting people. But I have prayed to my Lord and to Allah and said to him that whenever I insult and curse someone, then give it to them as charity and reward in exchange. And 
Chapter 68, verse 4 says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ O Muhammad, your akhlaq is magnificent. There is no one like you in akhlaq. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Your akhlaq is عظيم, O Muhammad. If we portray our Prophet like this, then why do we complain when the media goes to town on the Prophet? This is all we are asking. We are not trying to speak ill of Bukhari or Muslim. The book was written centuries ago. There may have been political reasons to make it, that give, it give it that status of Sahih to it. But can we close our eyes and ignore all this? You see, today an ordinary person like me, if I, let's say, Alhamdulillah, don't have a habit of cursing and insulting people, but I lose control one day, let's say road rage, someone I meet, and then I insult and curse him. And then my wife says to me, you never lose your cool, but if you insulted him, that guy must be really bad, right? What would be the decent thing for me to do? The decent thing for me to do would be to say, no, it's inexcusable. I shouldn't have insulted and cursed him. I was wrong. I need to ask Allah forgiveness, and if I can find that person, I need to apologize to him. But supposing I said to my wife, no, I'm just mortal, I do it time and again, but I have uh, this arrangement with Allah that if I ever curse anyone, just in your books translate it and give him thawab. Right? What would that indicate about me? It would indicate that I am arrogant. It would indicate hubris. It is not logical that we should believe this of our beloved Prophet. O Muslims, we need to rethink what we are calling Sahih. And then we have Surah Abasa. Abasa wa tawalla, he frowned and he turned away because the poor blind man came to him and the Prophet was talking to some rich people in Quraysh trying to convert them to Islam and the poor man kept talking to the Prophet and it irritated him so he turned away and Allah rebukes the Prophet in the Quran. When Allah rebukes the Sahaba or the wives of the Prophet, we immediately defend them. And we say, no, 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 they repented and this was not like this, this was like that and so on. The Prophet, we write with fakhr, sharh and tafsir about what Abasa was all about. We can't go into all these details. There are so many other traditions and I want to be very honest here, my dear brother and sister, there are traditions in Bukhari and Muslim that I am ashamed to relate from the pulpit with regards to his wives, with regards to um, you know, drinking and selling wine, with regards to breaking oaths, with regards... You know, we all got very upset when Salman Rushdie wrote satanic verses. But we also extracts of what he wrote in the newspapers. I ask Muslims, Billahi al-Azim, the things that Salman Rushdie wrote, where did his inspiration come from? was not some of the trash he wrote, the inspiration, I'm not saying he took it word from word from the siha, but was it not inspired by what is in our books as hadith? We have to have the sincerity, the honesty to sit at the table and acknowledge these things. If we don't acknowledge we have a problem, we're not going to be able to fix the issues that the ummah has today. If we were to say any of these things that I have said about the Prophet regarding any of the Khulafa or Rashidun, there would be an uproar and there would be a fatwa of qatl and takfir against that individual who says these things about the Sahaba Kiram. But we speak about it so freely about the Prophet of Allah. We have to at least consider that the Umayyads and Abbasids had a reason to promote this sort of an idea amongst the Muslims. You see, when the media who hate Islam draw cartoons of the Prophet and write negative things about him, we protest, we march, we burn you know, effigies and so on. We show our faith and loyalty to the Prophet, not just the Shias, even the Sunni Muslims do it in mass all over the world. There's an uproar. But when these issues are found in the most authentic books of the Muslims, my question is only this much, what should we do? with an authentic tradition that contradicts the Qur'an and portrays the Prophet with such negativity. Just give us a solution. Should we ignore it? Should we sweep it under the rug? Should we accept it as authentic? 
Or should we at least acknowledge that these are untrue and that these contradict the Quran? That is all the Shia are asking for, really. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Now we might argue and say, well, there are millions, hundreds of millions of Sunni Muslims, but they'd never read these traditions. They don't even know these traditions exist in Bukhari and Muslim. But the point is, they don't read it, but the individuals who preach to them read it. And therefore, it influences their vision for Islam and their impression of what they want to say. It happens in all communities. Today in the Shia, I am preaching to you. I am influenced by certain ideas and values based on what I have read in the books of the Shias and in the hadith of the Imams. Right? If as a Shia I read certain books and was influenced by certain teachers and have a certain idea of the Ahlul Bayt that is extreme, then I will preach those extreme ideas to you. If I have been influenced by ideas that the Ahlul Bayt were very pluralistic uh, and had a very liberal idea of Islam, then I will preach that pluralism and liberalism to you. So, even how we feel about Sunni Muslims, the reason why you find that Shia preachers speak about Sunnis in very different ways, in very different extremes, is because they are influenced by what they understand to be the teachings and ideas and culture and thoughts of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, isn't it? So those who preach to the Sunni Muslims are reading these traditions. We're not saying that they're unjust or violent, but they're acknowledging these as authentic, and I have no idea how they're reconciling these with the Quran. Now, it would be unfair to say that all the Sunni Muslims or the vast majority of them are unjust or violent or in favor of extremism because of this hadith being present. But there is no doubt in the fact that there is something missing in the principles of the Ummah. In the Aqidah of the Ummah, there are some missing ingredients that stop the Ummah from being vaccinated against extremism and violence and injustices. Now let me explain this, what I mean by this. A virus does not always attack you every time. But if you are not vaccinated, when it shows up, then you are not immune to it. If Islam lacks those fundamental principles that re are required to insulate it from becoming unjust, then when radical elements show up and try and radicalize individuals from the Ummah, those individuals are not able to resist that radicalization because they lack those fundamental principles in their thought process and in their psyche. Think of it a bit like the flu shot. Every year, I get the flu, and every year I go to the doctor, and I look miserable, and I hope he'll feel sorry for me, but he doesn't. He looks at me and says, Mr. Jaffer, did you take the flu shot this year? No. Did I not tell you to take it last year? Yes. Why did you not take it? Ah, I thought I'd let my body fight it. Now, doctor, please give me some cure. Sorry, no cure. Go home, plenty of rest, lots of water. A few days later, you start feeling better. But you left it too long. We're going to talk about these principles of Adala and Imama to say that these principles insulate the Ummah from falling prey and victim to being radicalized. I'm saying this why? Because I want to make a point that will sound a little unfair, but it is actually very fair. Look at all the groups that are promoting terrorism in the name of Islam. Al-Qaeda, Taliban, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, ISIS, all of them. Do they not all come from one perspective? I hesitate to say they are all Sunni Muslims because the vast majority of Sunni Muslims are absolutely opposed to them. But we all say they have been influenced by a fundamentalist idea of Islam or Wahhabism or Salafism. Why are there no terrorist groups from the Shia? Why? Are we not human and fallible? Do we not get upset? Do we not get angry? But why do you not hear of some Shia militants stopping a bus somewhere in Pakistan or Afghanistan or Syria and 
pulling all the people out, separating Shia from Sunni, putting all the Sunnis on one side, shoot and kill all the men, and then molest the women and take the children as slaves. And why don't you hear that? Every Muharram you hear Shia mosques being bombed, Aza of Hussein being bombed all over the world. There are things that the Shia are upset about as well with regards to, 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 to what, for example, the Sunni Muslims might practice, right? For example, uh, you know, if I can give you just some examples, um, Shias are upset about the fact that Sunni Muslims don't regard Abu Talib to be a Muslim. They say Abu Talib is na'udhu billah kafir. That is very upsetting for us. Shia Muslims are very upset that the Sunni Muslims give so much importance to fasting on the day of Ashura. Or that the Sunni Muslims give so much importance to Taraweeh prayers, which was a bid'ah introduced by the second caliph. But have you ever heard of a Shia going to a mosque where Taraweeh is being prayed and then bombing the mosque? Why? It is not that the Shias are very special or there is something unique about the Shias. It is the fact that there is this idea of adala and justice that has been infused in us from the Ahlul Bayt that prevents us from behaving in a certain manner. And I've mentioned this before in different contexts. So let me give you a few very quick examples. From the time I am a child, I go to madrasa, my parents talk to me about the imams and different things. They teach me about how the prophet and the imams always helped the poor, helped those, which the Sunni Muslims do as well. But then because of my close attachment to the Ahlul Bayt, I hear the story of Sifin and Khandak and Khaybar all the time. And then I hear that in Sifin, Muawiyah had control of the river. And he used it as a strategy to prevent water from getting to the camp of Ali. And then uh, uh, Malik Ashtar, under the command of Amir al-Mu'mineen, attacks the army of Muawiyah and takes control of the river. As soon as Amir al-Mu'mineen has the river, he says, open it up. The enemies as well must drink. Why? Because water is the right of every human being. It cannot be used as an advantage point against the enemy. Today, there is no government, even a very, very democratic government, that will do this. They will say it is a foolish strategy from an army perspective. Even the United States that claims to be the champion of human rights and democracy, if they were in a war and they took control of the water supply for the enemy, they will use it to bring them to their knees. They will not say, oh, human right, give them water. Amir al-Mu'mineen is doing something that from at face value is a fatal mistake from a war strategy. But he is showing that taqwa is primary. <laughs> He says, People say Ali does not know war. If it was not for taqwa, I would have been the shrewdest amongst the Arabs. What is Muawiyah in front of me? People think he is smart. Then again, I hear the story of Ashura. I hear the story of how, you know, when Imam al Hussein met Hur, there was no water, he gave water to them, even though he was denied water. Then I hear the story of him being madhloom. Then I hear the story of how the Imams were kept in prison. Then I hear of how Imam al kadhims body was left on a bridge. And these ideas teach me to always side with the madhloom. And it teaches me that in Islam, the end does not justify the means. If you look at the statements that the Taliban made after 9-11, they said, we, there are conspiracy theories to say it wasn't you know, the Taliban and so on, but that all aside, the statements they made was, the reason we bombed the Twin Towers in New York is because you come to our countries in Afghanistan and Syria and others, and you bomb us, and you kill our women and our children and our men. We want you to know how that feels. You kill our women and children, we will kill your women and children. And that drives this whole idea of suicide bombers, where they go to public places where they kill innocent civilians. A Shia is strongly infused with this idea that just because someone is unjust to you, you cannot be unjust to him. Just because he kills your women and children, you cannot kill his women and children. There are rules even in jihad that if your enemy turns and starts fleeing, you cannot run after him and kill him. So 
This principle of Adala gives us this vaccination, this extra layer of protection. Just like, for example, in Islam, both Shia and Sunni say this, and I saw this today myself on a Sunni forum. Someone on a Sunni forum asked this question, how can we identify the munafiqun in our midst? How can we know who is a hypocrite in the Muslim ummah? And the other person wrote, he said, the messenger of Allah told us in our books that if you want to know a munafiq, talk about Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an. And if you see him happy, then he's a mu'min. If you see him sad, then he's a munafiq. And the person after puts a comment. He says, brother, are you a Shia? <laughs> and he writes below. He says, na'udhu billah. I never use Shia sources. These are authentic books of ours. So Shia and Sunni say this. In fact, Amir al-Mu'mineen says in Nahjul Balagha, the Prophet said to me, O oh Ali, a mu'min is incapable of hating you. O oh Ali, if you cut the nose of a believer with your sword, he will still not be able to hate you. And if you give a mountain of gold to a munafiq, he will still not be able to love you. That means the love of Ali is not a nice to have. It is a necessity of religion. It is an extra layer of protection. Now, this doesn't mean that anyone who doesn't follow Imam Ali is a munafiq. No. It means that that extra protection is missing. When you say, La ilaha illallah, it takes you out of shirk and kufr. It makes you a muwahid. But so does a Jew say, La ilaha illallah. Then when you say, Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadu Rasulullah, it takes you out of Ahlul Kitab, out of being a Jew and a Christian, and it makes you a Muslim, but it still doesn't take you out of Nifaq. Then when you say, Wa ashhadu anna aliyan waliyullah, now you are solid. Muwahid, Muslim, Mu'min, on accounts of both Shia and Sunni. So we need these extra layers of protection in our faith, and we are missing these elements of Adala and Imama, which is why Muslims slip and are victims to radicalization. And this is all we are trying to share and emphasize in these nights as we talk about this. So we hear of constant you know, strife and bombing in Quetta, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Syria, and so on. And I'm trying to show that a lot of this is the result of some ideas that we have left and taken from centuries ago and that we need to talk about it and change it. We also need to consider this fact that if a non-Muslim was to read those traditions I reported from Bukhari and Muslim about the Prophet do you in all honesty believe he or she would be attracted towards Islam and would consider being a Muslim? Those who do convert, I believe a lot of times, have never seen these traditions. Because if they saw them, they would certainly question them. And if they did become Muslims, they would not believe that these are authentic because it certainly does not portray the founder of Islam in the light that uh, um, he should be portrayed. So I want to wrap this up for tonight and say that one of the other issues that is contentious with regards to Sahaba that is often brought up is this issue of la'an. And Shia ulama have tried to explain a lot of times the difference between sub and shatam and la'an and saying that cursing, insulting, mocking, jeering, deriding, this is sub, shatam, this is not la'an. And that la'an is simply a prayer, it is a dua that you make asking Allah to remove you and distance you from certain individuals and to remove his mercy from certain individuals. Now, there is a common idea that why should we do la'an as Muslims? It is negative. And in fact, every Muharram, we have a sheikh who comes here from one of the uh, mosques that is frequented by the Sunni brothers. And he comes here usually in the 8th, 9th of Muharram. And he talks about Muslim unity. And mashallah, he's blessed with a beautiful voice. And he recites some na'at. And if you have heard him over the years, he has this message in every year he comes to say, let us focus on reciting salawat and blessings on the Prophet. Let us not focus on cursing and doing la'an. Now, if by cursing he means mocking, jeering, deriding, creating, inciting hatred amongst Muslims, then 100% we agree with him. But if by that we mean not invoking Allah to remove his mercy from certain individuals 
who are responsible for the plight of Muslims today, or not distancing ourselves from certain individuals, then we respectfully disagree. Why? And there are people who write online as well. If you look at some of the lectures by the Shia on YouTube and so on, they'll put a comment down. They'll say, very nice lecture, but a Muslim should never do la'an. And the reason they say that is because when we start our lectures, after we send blessings, we, we glorify Allah, we, we send blessings on the Prophet, we send blessings on the Ahlul Bayt, and then we says, وَلَعَنَتُ ala a'da'ihim ajma'in," And that they find objectionable. Now, in the Quran, Allah does la'an in many places. لَعَنَتُ اللَّهِ on the, you know, ظَالِمِينَ and so on and so forth. In hadith, we have many places where the Prophet ﷺ has said la'an on individuals and said la'an on these or la'an on those. They are not saying this in the sense of cursing and slander, but in the sense of that prayer. I have one question to ask. If we say that there is no need to do la'an because Allah already knows who deserves to go to heaven and who deserves to go to hell. And if an individual is deserving of Allah's wrath, then Allah will deal with him on the day of judgment. Why do we need to, in a sense, add fuel to the fire? Right? Why do la'an when Allah can handle it? My answer to that question is, if that is the case, then why do salawat either? Allah commands us in the Quran, as we saw last night, that Allah and his angels send salawat on the Prophet. O you who believe, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, doesn't Allah know that he needs to bless his Prophet? Can Allah not bless his Prophet so abundantly that the Prophet should not need our blessings? Is the Prophet muhtaj of our salawat? But why do the Muslims insist that every time they mention the name of the Prophet, they say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Why is Allah insisting we do that when our salawat does not add or elevate the status of the Prophet? The reason is because that salawat is not for the Prophet, it is for us. It asserts and crystallizes our faith. It tells us where we stand. It re-emphasizes my tawalla. In that same manner, when I recite a dua that is a la'an, it is also solidifying and crystallizing my faith and saying, these are my friends and these are not my friends. <coughs> and there are numerous incidents that unfortunately I can't get into right now, where individuals had very strong faith and they knew who the right and the pious were, but they didn't know who the unrighteous were. So when the time for test came, they wavered. Like in the Battle of Jamal, where individuals, Muslims, pious, Sahaba of the Prophet came to Amir al-Mu'mineen and said, Oh Ali, this is the first civil war between Muslims. If you think I'm going to come with you to battle and kill my fellow Muslim brothers, you're mistaken. And what did Ali say to them? He said, you have seen right and recognized it, but you have not seen wrong and recognized it. So Tabarra has its role as well. It's not about slandering or pushing fists in the air, but it is important. I want to conclude by saying that the issue that the Shia have with this whole issue of Sahabiyat is that the Muslims have taken a very literal approach to say, as long as you said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you are Muslim. As long as you saw the Prophet even once, you are Sahaba. The Shia's attitude is we must not take things completely at face value. We must be able to also judge a person by his actions and his past. You can summarize this difference between the Sunni attitude and the Shia attitude in the personalities of Abu Sufyan and Abu Talib. The Sunni Muslims say Abu Talib was not a Muslim. Why? Because he never recited Kalima Shahada until he died. Abu Sufyan is Muslim, is Sahaba. Why? Because he recited Kalima. The Shia say, look at the circumstances for both of them. Abu Talib protected the Prophet since childhood. The Quraysh did not touch the Prophet as long as Abu Talib was alive. Abu Talib recited the Aqdun Nikah of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib opened his valley, Shaib Abu Talib, to protect the family of the Prophet. Abu Talib used to switch where his sons sleep, Ali and Ja'far and Aqil, to protect the Prophet ﷺ. Him you call a kafir. Abu Sufyan was the arch enemy of the Prophet until the Prophet showed up at Makkah. And then also he referred to him as a king. 
and he surrendered Mecca and recited Kalima to save his life, him you call a Muslim. That is where we have a problem. That is where we are saying things cannot be so literal. And so I want to end with these words of Ash'ar by a very well-known poet, someone that I admire greatly, an Urdu poet, Shaheed uh, Professor Sibte Jafar Saab. He, uh, uh, you know, he has this one poem where the ending is waghera, the, the radif is all waghera. He says, Ashab te kya bu zaro salman waghera. Ashab te kya bu zaro salman waghera. Jo ban gaye Islam ke pehchan waghera. Allah na kare koi ho is tarha musalman. Allah na kare koi ho is tarha musalman. Te jese musalman bu sufyan waghera. This summarizes the idea that the Shias have to say that if we're going to talk about right and wrong, orthodox Islam, the idea of justice has to be there. We have to talk about justice and not base it on simply how I was raised and who I'm opposed to. And the Quran says this, وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَن لَا تَعْدِلُوا إِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُوا لِلتَّقْوَىٰ O you who have faith, do not let your hatred for a community make you such that you stop being just. Be just. That is closer to taqwa. And we shall emphasize this again and again, insha'Allah, through the night. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad. Wa Ali Muhammad. Sallallahu wa sallam alayka ya Aba Abdillah. Ruhi wa arwahul alameen alakal fida. Ya laytana kunna ma'akum sayyidi Aba Abdillah. فنفوز فوزا عظيما. <coughs> Tonight is the third night of Muharram, and we continue giving our condolences to the mother of Hussein and sharing in this grief and in these days of Azar. Tonight we want to start talking about the Ashab and the Ansar of Hussein alayhi salam. And in particular, we want to start with the first Shaheed in Karbala, Hor ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, and his sons and his brother and his slave. These were the first ones to go to battle. Of all the nights that we cry for Hussein, this night is very special. The reason it is so special is because a lot of times when we speak of the Ashab of Hussein, we see them as being almost infallible in how special they were. Hur alayhi salam came very close to losing salvation. He made some mistakes and was rescued at the last moment. And that is very inspiring for us because we are all fallible beings and we all make mistakes in life and we all commit sins. We all find times in our lives where we have disobeyed Allah, where we have stopped praying, for example, we have stopped fasting, for example. We sometimes get to a point in our lives where we commit such shameful deeds that we even begin to wonder if we will ever be saved. Hur alayhi salam teaches us the recipe for salvation, how to save your soul. He inspires us and he teaches us. And what I want to show you is that what saved Hur on the day of Ashura was only one personality and that personality was Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. And that is the secret recipe that when all is lost in your life, when you are rock bottom in your faith and your spirituality, and you have no way of standing up again and rising from the ashes, 
And if you cannot find any shafi' and any intercessor to help you, then think of asking Fatima for help. By Allah, she will not disappoint you. By Allah, she will not disappoint you. And my heart tonight says to Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Hur stopped you from going to Kufa. Hur stopped you from returning to Medina. Hur is the reason your children were crying Al Atash, Al Atash. Hur is the one who held the reins of your horse with audacity. But Aba Abdullah, when Hur came to you and said, Mawla, can I be forgiven? <laughs> you did not disappoint him, O oh Hussein. Will you not intercede for us, Yabna Rasulillah, when we come to you, Yawmul Qiyamah? Allah is a witness at the overflowing love for you, O oh Hussein, in the hearts of those who weep for you tonight. Ajrukum ala Allah. Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi was no ordinary man. He was a brave commander in the army of Yazid. When Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad found out that Hussein is on his way to Kufa, he set a curfew in Kufa so that no one could go in or out. But he sent out a thousand men under the command of Hur and said to Hur, Patrol the outskirts of Kufa and look for Hussein. And wherever you find him, arrest him. And do not let him enter Kufa, but do not let him go back to Medina either. Imam al Hussein stopped at one place where there was an oasis and he commanded Abu Fadl al Abbas and said, Here onwards there is a desert awaiting us. Fill all the mashkiza with water. As much water that we can fill, take an oversupply of water. So the water was replenished to its max. And this small qafila of 72 men with women and children moving, children frightened, anxious, knowing that Muslim has been killed, knowing they cannot go back to Medina, knowing they have left Makkah, knowing they are now roaming the desert, they are now ghuraba, not knowing where they are going. They come to a place where they meet the army of Hur. When Imam Hussein meets the army of Hur, the army of Hur has run out of water. And they are so thirsty that it would have been absolutely easy for them to kill all of them and massacre them. Imam al Hussein sees an army of thirsty men, immediately he rushes to begin quenching their thirst. This is the son of Saqi of Kawthar. He begins depleting the water that he has saved for his family. One of the soldiers in the army of Yazid says that I was given a water skin, a mashkiza with water, but I was so thirsty, I was so weak, I could not even open it to drink the water. And I kept seeing that water skin before me, Dying of thirst, but unable to open it. Suddenly, I saw a shade over me. Who is this shade? The son of Zahra himself. Hussein bent down. He opened the mashkiza. He held the head of a man who will fight against him. He poured the water in his mouth. I ask this man. On the day of Ashura, when the children of Hussein were crying, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. Did you not remember this moment when your head was on the lap of Hussein? Ajrukum ala Allah. The qafila of the army of Hur quenches their thirst. The time of Salat comes. Hussein leads the Salat. The army of Hur prays behind Hussein because he is the grandson of the Prophet. As the two camps are side by side, Hussein tells Abbas, We wish to move. They mount their horses, they close their camp, they want to move. Hur comes to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. He says, Where are you going, O Hussein? Hussein alayhi salam says to Hur, O Hur, I am going to Kufa. He says, No, O Aba Abdullah, I have been commanded that you shall not go to Kufa. Aba Abdullah al Hussein says to Hur, In that case, I will return to the Medina of my Jad. By Allah, O Hur, I did not come to Kufa to cause mischief. 
It is the people of Kufa who invited me. And he shows him a camel full of letters. Hur was not aware that Muslim had been killed. And Hur was not even aware of the letters that had been written to Hussein. He said, I do not know anything of these letters, O Hussein. But I have been commanded, you shall not go to Kufa, nor shall you go to Medina. Imam al Hussein turns his horse as if leaving towards Medina. And at this point, we are told that Hur grabs the reins of Hussein's horse. He grabs the lajam of Hussein. But Hussein, when he sees his horse being held, he looks at Hur and says to him, Ya Hur, thakalatka ummuka, Ya Hur. Oh Hur, may your mother weep for you. How dare you hold my horse? Now look at how Fatima saves Hur. As soon as Hur hears this, he lets go of the horse of Hussein. He steps back. What does he say? He say, Oh Hussein, by Allah, if you, if your mother would have been anyone else, I would have said the same thing to you. But what can I say to you, Oh Hussein, when your mother is the daughter of my Prophet? Go, Oh Hussein, we will follow you wherever you go, but don't go to Medina. Now this Qafila is heading towards the desert and the army of Hur is following them behind. On the 2nd of Muharram, Imam al Hussein stops at Karbala. This camp stays in Karbala near the banks of Time Umar ibn Sa'ad comes with more troops. He takes over the command from Hur. The Ahlul Bayt are moved from Furat towards the middle of the desert. Army after army comes and camps after camps are set up. The water runs out in the camp of Hussein from the 7th of Muharram. The children are now crying for thirst. The adults are drinking less water so the children can have water. Hur every night is hearing the children crying, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. The day of Ashura comes. Salatul Fajr, the Adhan of Ali Yunil Akbar. As the day begins to dawn, one man from the camp of Yazid says, he says, I saw Hur on that day pacing up and down restlessly. I came to him and said, Oh Hur, if anyone would have asked me who is the bravest man in the army of Yazid, I would have mentioned your name. Why are you so nervous this morning when we are about to set in battle? Hur replies the man and says, Wallahi ukhayiru nafsi bayn al jannati wa nar. Oh man, I find myself now pacing between heaven and hell. The man says, Oh Hur, what do you mean by this? He says, Come, I will tell you what I mean by this. He takes him closer to the camp of Hussein. He says, Listen, do you hear anything from the camp of Hussein? The man listens to the camp of Hussein. He says, I hear young children crying, Ah, Al Atash, thirst is killing us. He says, This is why I am finding myself between the heavens and the and hell and paradise. Oh man, it is I who brought Hussein to Karbala. These children are, are the children of Zahra. They cry Al Atash because of me. What will I reply? The mother of Hussein on the day of judgment. Hur makes up a decision. He is going to move to Hussein. But Hur cannot move out without anyone noticing. Another man reports, he says, what Hur did was he took his slave and his brother and his son. He pretended he was going towards Furat to give water to his horse. And as he moved away from the camp of Yazid, he turned now and came towards the Qafila of Hussein. Now Hur comes from that side. Imam al Hussein calls Abbas. He says, Abbas, we have a guest approaching. <laughs> Abbas, we have one more mehman coming towards us. Go out and receive him. Hur stops before he comes towards Hussein. He gets off from his horse. He calls his servant. He tells him, I am ashamed to go before Hussein in this manner. Tie my hands first before I go to Hussein. The servant ties the hands of Hussein. Then, the, then Hur says to his servant, he says, now blindfold me. I am ashamed to see the eyes of my Aqa and Mawla. The servant ties a band on the eyes of Hur, now Hur says to the servant, hold my hand and lead me towards Hussein. When I reach Hussein, then tell me I have reached before him. Abbas comes and receives them. Now Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and Hur and his son and his brother and his servant all come before Hussein. 
when they reach Abba Abdullah al Hussein, the servant of Hur says, Mawla, your Imam now stands before you. But when Hur heard this, he fell at the feet of Hussein. He said, Abba Abdullah al Hussein, I am Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi. I am the one who stopped you going to Kufa. I am the one who stopped you returning to Medina. Your children are crying Allah Tash because of me. Ya Abba Abdullah, Halli Minat Tawbah. Is there any chance that you will forgive me? Is there any way I can find repentance about Abdullah al Hussein? Look at Hussein, Kareem ibn al Kareem. He holds Hur and raises him up again. He unties the hands of Hur. He hugs Hur and says, Oh Hur, do not embarrass Hussein. Oh Hur, you are my Mehman. Hussein is embarrassed. We have nothing to offer you. We have run out of water. Hur asks about Abdullah al Hussein, Oh Hussein, have you truly forgiven me? Yes, oh Hur. Hur, I have truly forgiven you. Now Hur asks Hussein. He says, Abba Abdullah al Hussein, is there any way I can speak to the women in your camp? This is a riwayah I have read myself. Hussein takes Hur towards the camp of the women. Hur stands outside the tents of the women. He begins to call out. He says, Assalamu alaykunna ya nisa'i alin nabi. O women of the family of the Prophet, this is Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi. O women of the Prophet, it is I, Hur. The reason why your children cry Allah Tash is because of me. The reason you are surrounded by the forge of Yazid is because of me. The reason you have not gone back to the Medina of your Jad is because of me. Oh women from the family of the Prophet, Abba Abdullah al Hussein has forgiven me. Will you forgive her as well? The women begin to, to, to weep. Fidda calls out, Oh Hur, we have forgiven you. Now look at Hur's ihtaram for Sayyida. Look at Hur's ihtaram for Fatima. When the women call out and say, Oh Hur, we go, we have forgiven you. Hur says, No, O oh women of Alin Nabi, I will still not live. I still have a question to ask you. O oh women from the family of the Prophet, I wish to ask you, will you complain about Hur to Fatima on the day of judgment? <laughs> will you complain about me to Fatima? By Allah, I will not move a step until you assure me you will not complain of me to Fatima. The women begin to weep. Oh, Hur, go, oh, Hur, we will not complain to Zahra about you. Hur has now some itminan. Fatima is pleased with me. Hur comes back to Abba Abdullah. Oh, Hussein, I am the cause of your misery. Oh, Hussein, let me go fight first in battle. Hussein gives permission to Hur. Hur goes out for jihad. The Arbab of Azaz say Hur kills 40 from the army of Yazid. When Hur falls down and calls out, Assalamu alaikum ya Abba Abdullah. This is the first lash that Hussein runs out to. From here onwards, Hussein will keep going out to the Maidan. Hussein goes out to the battlefield. He sits beside the body of Hur. He places the body of Hur on his, on his lap. Hur's face is covered with sand and blood. The son of Zahra wipes the blood from Hur's face. When he wipes the blood from Hur's face, he sees a fountain of blood from the forehead of Hur. Hussein removes a handkerchief that was stitched by Fatima. Hussein ties the handkerchief on the forehead of Hur. I would say, Oh Hur, Oh Hur, who wants Jannah when you have received the rumal of Fatima? This is the gift of Fatima to you. Imam al Hussein now remembers that I. I had said to Hur, Thakalatka Ummog. Perhaps Hur is pained by the fact that I spoke of his mother. He says to him, Oh Hur, Oh Hur, your mother truly named you right when some matka ummuka ya Hur, anta Hurun fit dunya wal akhira. Oh Hur, you are free now in this world and in the, in the hereafter. The Arbab of Azaz say that before Hur went out for jihad, he asked his son to go out for jihad. The son of Hur was the same age of Ali Yunil Akbar. When the son of Hur went for jihad, when he fell down, Hur was sitting beside Hussein. As soon as he fell down, he called his father and said, Assalamu alaikum ya abata adrikni. Baba, I have fallen down. Come and rescue me. But instinctively, Hur stood up. He began running to the Maidan. The Arbab of Azaz say, 
Hussein ran after Hor. He stopped him and held him back. Hor, fathers do not go and bring the mayit of their sons from the Maidan. Oh Hor, you will not be able to do this. Wait here, oh Hor. Hussein will bring the lash of your jawan. I would ask, Aqa, when Ali Yunil Akbar falls, who will hold you back? Yes, I know who will hold you back, oh Hussein. You will keep falling and stumbling on the hot sands of Karbala. The sands of Karbala will hold your feet. Aqa Hussein, you will not be able to go to the lodge of Ali Yunil Akbar. Wa Husayna, wa Madluma, wa Gariba, ma Tameh Husayn, ya Husayn, ya Husayn.